I would like to thank you all for attending the screening today. Uh, my name is Ian Thomas Ash. I am also a documentary filmmaker who works in Fukushima and a member of this club. I will be serving today as the MC for this discussion and q and A. I would first like to introduce uh, Mr. Pio de Miria. He is uh, starring in this film and is also one of the writers. After we hear uh, brief uh, comments from him, we will open the floor for the Q&A. Please. <coughs> Hello, everybody. <coughs> Thank you for coming. Seems quite strange for me to be sit in the center of this table after so many times uh, that I have been sit on the on the left, never on the right, never. Uh, actually, I did it already once. Some of the old members would remember that uh, in 2008. I showed him a documentary that I did on North Korea, which was quite different from this one. So I hope uh, that we can uh, address uh, many issues uh, by answering uh, the questions. I have been always told that I'm very tough in uh, asking questions, but Trust me, I am always all, also very tough in answering them, so please challenge me. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, all the people that are here today, but also all the people who has uh, worked with me alongside, especially in those days. One of them, I think, is not here because he, he saw the the movie many times, uh, Stefano Carrer, who is uh, not in this movie, but is in this movie, because uh, he was most of the time with me, driving cars, giving advices. So I owe him a lot. I owe a lot of all those uh, cameramen that uh, sometimes to the risk with me, and also to those who didn't. A couple of times they told me, no, you're crazy, I go back. Uh, but most of all, I would like uh, to state here on record that uh, this movie is uh, dedicated uh, to the Japanese people in general, especially to the Fukushima people, to those, uh, of course, who are the victims of the tsunami, but uh, also and the most to those who survived the human catastrophe, the human uh, caused the catastrophe of the nuclear accident, a catastrophe that is still going on despite all the efforts by then and especially present government to hide it. As a citizen of the world, not only of uh, Italy and Japan, I found extremely embarrassing, extremely disgusting, extremely unacceptable that the government lies to his citizens. And this is what is going happening right now in Japan. Thank you. So we will now open the floor um, to your questions. We'll start with uh, members first and then open the floor uh, to guests. And could I please ask that you turn your cell phones off? Thank you. So please come up to the mic uh, and state your name and affiliation, and then briefly uh, state your question. Uh, hello, my name is Albert Siegel. I, uh, I guess I have a question for you, uh, Pio. Um, is, uh, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you for making this documentary. It's really fantastic. Um, I think, really, honestly, I say it's the best one I've seen. But you say in the documentary you were scared. How many that, did you see? Um, I don't know. Shoot, I mean, between, I guess, uh, the educational ones or whatever, maybe six, seven? Okay. So, thank you. of those I've seen, yours is the best one. Okay. Um, you said in, you were scared at the time. You weren't sure whether to leave or not. And I wonder, um, after everything's gone on, and um, I mean, few people know as much about it as you do, um, are you still scared now? And do you regret the decision to stay? Or do you, um, I mean, how do you feel now after five years? <clears throat> well, 
as I think I said in the movie, but especially I wrote in my book. I wrote a book, and it was translated in Japanese too. Uh, first of all, I didn't think very seriously to leave this country because, as I said, uh, I lived in this country more than 30 years, which is more the Kahans, more the majority of the time of my life. So I consider myself, if not uh, from the juridical point of view, certainly from the human point of view, as Japanese as Italian, probably more Japanese because I lived more time here. So I never really considered the, the chance of going back. I was scared a little bit, yes, but you know, journalists would understand what I'm saying now. We are, somehow we have this fatal attraction for peril, for adventure, for adrenaline. So I consider our profession a little bit like uh, those other professions who conduct a new, a good life uh, on average, but when the moment comes, has to take more risk than the others. I'm talking about diplomats, I'm talking about uh, lawyers, uh, doctors, missionaries. You know, we belong to this category that uh, if there is uh, the need, we have to be there more than uh, anybody else. And I thought that my duty, and also my right as a citizen, was to understand what was going on. And I would never trust uh, a government, even Khan's government, uh, about telling us the truth, especially in the case of uh, a nuclear disaster, which everybody knows uh, since ever, since ever and ever, has been built on omissions and lies. So that's the, the main point. The second one is, uh, I don't know, I, I, I went through all the checks uh, during and after. I feel great, I feel no any, any sickness. Actually, I, I, I got much better. Somebody says that radiation at a small level even helps to cure. So, you know, there is radiation therapy for cancer, so I don't know. Maybe I cured uh, something that I had I didn't know. I don't know. But uh, if you ask me about if I am scared, yes, I am scared. And everybody should be scared because contrary to Chernobyl, or Chernobyl, I don't know in English, Chernobyl, I was there uh, two weeks ago for the 30th anniversary. We did a live broadcast for my television from Chernobyl, and we spoke about Fukushima there. It was my idea. Uh, I think that contrary to Chernobyl, which right after a few months everybody knew what was going on and, and everything was, quote, under control somehow, in Fukushima it is not under control. After five years we still have three reactors melting down or rather melting through, which is an awful dangerous situation. And I wonder if uh, what we have been through until now is really the worst. I am afraid that we still may be in the danger of what something that could still happen. I, I imagine a new earthquake. What would happen if we have not even an eight uh, degree uh, or you know just a six or seven degree right there? What would happen now that the reactors are much more indefendable than before? So. I really believe that what the Japanese government and Toden is doing, to less in my opinion, is, is really risky, is dangerous, is, uh, I don't know, I, mean, I, I don't feel like living in a country that is the number two or number three uh, economy in the world. They should do much better, they should do something about this. This is crazy what is going to happen. And the more craziness is that the people don't know, don't know. Mr. Abe is going abroad every week and so, and making his statements, and not one word on Fukushima, not on one word on the survivors, on the Hinansha. I think this is very, very disappointing, very sad for this country. 
if I could just ask a quick follow-up question um, about uh, the government, do you think uh, do you think the, the Japanese government is is particularly um, dishonest, or do you think this is simply how governments are? I mean, if this, if this had happened in a different country, in Italy, for example, would it be, have been any different? Well, people who know me, who knows me, uh, would know already the answer. Yes, I believe that governments by default tends to lie. Uh, but in particular, Abe's government, the government that came after Kansan, is uh, much more lying than the others. At least he's omitting. And omitting equals to lying, in my opinion. It is helped a lot in this country by the fact that there is no real investigative media. Or if there are investigative media, they don't go to the mainstream. I have a lot of respect for a lot of free media in Japan, the internet. I can quote several of them, the National Journal and the others, no border. But uh, at main level, I mean, big newspapers, big televisions, they do not their job properly. And this probably is the difference with the other countries, for example, Italy. If in Italy such a thing would happen, the government would probably do the same but the media would uh, be much more brave. Sir. Hi, Pio. I'm Joël Lejean from uh, TV5 World RTL. Uh, congratulations, Pio. It's fantastic. But uh, I'd like to know, in the process of doing the movie and making the movie and editing the movie, there's something that is quite fascinating in this investigation that you're doing here. You're using manga. You're using a lot of technological technological things, whatever. You maybe use some kind of drone or thing like this. C could you tell us a little bit about how you got with this idea that probably makes a difference between your movie and many others? Thank you. Well, I, re I regret, thank you, Joel. Uh, I regret um, that uh, my friend and director, no, he's not here, uh, Matteo Gagliardi, uh, who is actually in Japan right now, but he got somehow, somehow lost in Kyushu, I don't know, um, is not here because actually all what concerns the narration uh, techniques, the different level of narration of this movie is his uh, performance. He was the, uh, the one who invented this different layer of narration. Uh, we discussed them a lot. At the beginning, I must tell you that I didn't agree very much, being uh, more uh, of a writer and uh, of, uh, of, of, of operator. I mean, I, I, I didn't even imagine how could it turn out. And I'm, I must say that I was very, very happy because everybody says, um, more or less, we had a lot of uh, good reviews abroad. I mean, this movie has been sold already in 14 countries, 15, I think, including the United States, not in Japan. I open a parenthesis, we send the, the video and the link to all the Japanese main televisions, and we got only one answer from Telebi Azahi, no thank you. But all the others didn't reply yet, so much for the Japanese kindness, and uh, you know, at least they could say, oh, you know, we don't like it, or we can't show it. No reply at all. Um, I think that the main reason why Matteo decided to use the manga was uh, that we wanted to be close to Japan way of narration. This is uh, an Italian uh, concept, concept movie, but it's also about Japan. And everybody knows that Japan uh, is, uh, you know, the, 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 the cradle of, of manga. So we thought of this movie to be shown in Japan. And uh, so that's why it's a pity that the Japanese people cannot see this. And the other reason is, uh, uh, not only the manga, but the graphics. You notice that there are a lot of computer graphics. We were very, very, very careful in, uh, you know, we, we had the pictures of TEPCO, and we reproduced all these on, on computer, because we wanted to show what we could not shoot. In a newspaper, when you write, you can talk about uh, Joël Legendre without uh, showing him. But if you do a documentary, just a reportage on Joël Legendre, you have to get Joël Legendre, or at least somebody who looks like him, 
you know, in television we do some fakes sometimes. Uh, 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 so that was the reason. We wanted to show the, the Daiichi, we wanted to show uh, uh, the the damages caused by the, the earthquakes and by the, the tsunami. And the only way that we could that we could do that was to reconstruct, I mean redesign this on, on a computer and show it as, mu as, as much as possible as the original. And that is why I went many times to Daiichi, Joel also joined many times, just because we I wanted to take pictures of the the, the, the buildings, so on. The TEPCO was so much uh, scary and, and, and worried about us uh, shooting uh, the sensitive stuff, but I wasn't interested at all. I was interested in shooting where the gomi was there, there the garbage, or you know, the, the reiki, and all that. So uh, this is the reason why we, we mixed the, the layer of narration in this movie, and I think it was uh, a good choice. Sir Anthony, yeah. Um, Anthony Rowley, <coughs> Singapore Business Times. Um, let me add my congratulations, Pia, on a very, very good movie indeed. Um, two questions which you may be able to answer, not because you're a nuclear expert, but because you've talked to many people who are nuclear experts. First, when Naoto Kan said at the end, it would have been the end of Tokyo if um, those fuel rods had actually melted. Uh, did you get a, a more accurate um, interpretation of that, what actually could have happened? How far could the radiation have spread had that indeed happened? Another interesting point in the film was that um, there was a mention of the fact that the damage to the reactors might have been caused at least partly not by the tsunami but by the earthquake, which of course is incredibly important in a country which has so many nuclear reactors. Um, there seems to be no solid evidence that that was the case. Did you come across any evidence that the um, reactors were in fact damaged by the earthquake. Okay, let me answer the second one because uh, I'm getting older and I may forget the second one. Um, yes, indeed, we are uh, convinced and we have evidence of the fact that the initial uh, blackout of the Daiichi was caused by the earthquake. And this is not Pio D'Emilia who states this, it's uh, many reports, including the Kurokawa report. And I must say that many journalists, foreign journalists, uh, did uh, denounce this uh, in the very beginning. May I quote just David uh, McNeil, he was one of the first who wrote about this. Uh, so we cannot say that the reactors were damaged by the earthquake, but the plant was stopped by the falling down, and in English, the collapse of a, what do you call it in English? The, uh, no, 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 the, the, the one of electricity. The, eh? Poles, yeah. You know, the poles that bring uh, the, the, the cables. cables. The, uh, two of them were damaged and one collapsed on the ground. There are pictures of this. And that was the initial black, in, in, in ignited the first, uh, blackout, which brought to the stop of the plant, and uh, therefore of the cooling system. Now, the emergency cooling system started right away, and unfortunately, the tsunami came, and the uh, emergency uh, uh, um, generators, as everybody knows, instead of being on the roof, were underground. So very silly and stupid uh, design. So this is the uh, second. And the first is uh, about Khan. Yeah, as you know, I, 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 have, uh, I have the privilege, I would say, uh, even if now is not so popular, to have been very close to Khan San in the past. So yes, we did uh, speak a lot. Actually, Khan San, as you know, he's one of the very few politicians that has a clue about uh, technical and physical stuff because he's uh, himself an engineer. So he knows how to say what he says. Uh, I'm not sure that I can uh, 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 relay in technical terms uh, what w could have happened, but basically what I understood is that if 
the bars inside the small pool would have been exposed to air, then there would be a open air meltdown, which is much more serious than the meltdown that is actually still going on in Fukushima. And all this would have uh, caused a, a, a fallout that could have reached 200, 300 kilometers, nobody knows. So it's, of course, a hypothesis, but it, it is a, 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 a working hypothesis. It could have happened. And the very fact, once again, that this did, did not happen by chance, I think tells you a lot about the totally unreliability uh, of the nuclear energy. Sir. Because you know, if, uh, if, a, if uh, a photovoltaic, a solar plant collapses, would kill some uh, vegetables or some pigeons, you know, but would not cause what Fukushima caused. Uh, my name is Khalil, I'm an honorary member. Uh, you had a message, and you put it beautifully well, in a very artistic way. <clears throat> But the important point, how this message is going to get to as wide as possible. My question is, how are you going to do that? My other point of, of the question is, <clears throat> now, capitalism, you give a chance for the private to play an important role. And they did a brilliant job. But there are problems. <clears throat> and one of the problems, are something like nuclear power. Now, from this experience, do you think a nuclear power should be a government issue or should be a role played by the private company? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Well, Toria Ezu, I would say that uh, in my opinion, and I hope this opinion is shared by many other people around the world, is that nuclear energy should not be an issue, nor of the government, nor of the privates. I mean, basically, I'm against the use of nuclear energy at every level, for Bangladesh, for India, for Russia. You know, there is a lot of debate now going on that, you know, industrialized nation may get away with the nuclear, but this developing country needs it because uh, it's, you know, that's all, in my opinion, bullshit, I'm sorry. Nuclear energy is dangerous, and on top of that, it's not economically valuable anymore. This is the big issue now. You all know that Germany, the Teutonic, uh, philosophically rational Germany. You know, Italians were accused by the Japanese right after the referendum that we voted out of emotion. We are accused of being emotional people that vote only because it was an accident. Yes, maybe that's so, but Germans, no. Germans are very rational, you know, all the philosophy they have. I mean, they, they, don't, they don't make decision out of, you know, romantic issues. So, why did Germany give up? Mr. Kahn, two weeks ago, was in Germany. He got a, an award for fighting against nuclear power in Germany. The reason is because somebody there in the government, a conservative government, decided, made some you know, balancing one plus one minus two, whatever, and they decided that it's not valuable anymore. I wonder why the Japanese government is not able to do this very simple arithmetics. When they say that uh, the production for kilowatt, our kilowatt is uh, cheap, it's true. But they lied all over the years because they didn't put in inside the, the, the cost of uh, stocking, of uh, waste, and of accidents. I'm sure that by now everybody has uh, understand, understand that uh, if you add all these costs, the production per unit of kilowatt is much more higher not only economically and socially. So I, I see no reason why still risking all this. I mean, the Japanese government has promised four years ago to start up the, the plants again. After three years, I think that only one now is working, right? 
only one or three, and then they closed again. I, I didn't follow much the last uh, months, but I think that right now only one is is actually functioning. Many other countries said no. Italy said no. Germany said no. Switzerland said no. Yes, France is still going on. They, they say that our reactors are safer than the others. Good luck. I hope so, especially because I'm in Italy, so I'm close from, from them. But still, an industrialized country like Japan, like Italy, like America, could and should go over it and uh, disinvest from a dangerous item into less dangerous items. If Japan had invested the same money, the same amount that invested in nuclear energy in uh, renewable energies, this country would now be the example the green hope of the rest of the world. And I'm sure they're doing this. They are doing it actually right now. Mitsubishi, Kawasaki, uh, Hitachi, and all these other you know, nuclear uh, uh, um, companies are actually now switching from nuclear into renewable. They just need time. I may be wrong, but we can meet here in 10 years, probably, and I think Japan is going to give up with nuclear because they will understand that it's not reliable, it's not economically, and hopefully the Japanese people will also stand up a little bit more. Uh, we have only a few minutes left, but the first part of his question, if you can maybe speak very briefly, is uh, your film has a strong message. How oh, are I you see. planning yeah. to get the yeah, message sorry. out? Well, you know, usually these kind of uh, uh, movies are supposed to be s shown in televisions and then in, uh, in cinemas. As I said, uh, uh, all around the world there is enough, I think, enough interest. We are quite happy with what happened until now. In Japan, unfortunately, this is not going to be the case, but we have also some ideas. Uh, as I said, I don't trust anymore mainstream uh, 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 media, and I think the Japanese also are starting to have a less 100% uh, confidence in them. So. There are other routes, which is the shukai, I mean, showing in them during rallies, during uh, social events. Uh, and uh, over Vimeo, you know, Vimeo, Vimeo, Vimeo. I think a lot of people now are ready to, you know, contact Vimeo and pay. Our movie is, uh, by the way, an information is uh, on Vimeo and you can download it for 48 hours for the equivalent of four euro, which is quite affordable, and gives us some money back, and at the same time gives, uh, you know, the possibility to watch it even in groups. People can organize uh, a screening uh, night. I mean, I think that uh, information, we are in an era of information, and information, good and bad information, are prone to be you know, to, to, to be, uh, say, to flow. There is no way to, to block information. So we have time for one more question, maybe that somebody who hasn't answered a question, but did you want? But if you want to answer. No, just to follow up, uh, Pio. You are saying to us that we can't see the movie in any cinema in, in Japan, for instance? Yeah. yeah. Or those private cinemas, or what we call in French, RSA? Uh, not yet, Joel. Uh, let, let us, uh, you know, uh, I hope that, yes, there are some cinemas, uh, we are talking with some distributors. You know, I was not around here, so I could not... Uh, uh, invest so much time and efforts, but I'm sure that if some friends helps me, uh, we will, uh, in, so, in small uh, cinemas, yes. But certainly you won't see in the Asai Hall or NHK Live. So, yes, yeah, yes. Maybe for the final question. Okay. And while you're coming up to the mic, I can say as a filmmaker, uh, the, the distribution of documentaries is difficult. <laughs> I mean, just everywhere yes. in general, let alone films that are about Fukushima. Yeah, uh, Kurt Heinz, I'm an associate member. Um, so you said that uh, Nautokan is your friend and uh, he was a supporter of nuclear energy before the accident and now he converted. He is uh, strongly opposing nuclear energy. So he turned from Saul to Paul. and uh, uh, But he received an award in Germany. But this does not mean a lot for Japan. And in Japan, obviously, he is not very popular nowadays, and nobody listens to him. So what is the reason behind this, yeah? uh, possibly, that such a person who 
uh, went with Japan through this crisis and did a lot, but is blamed mostly for this crisis, yeah? uh, that he cannot uh, rise in any way uh, anymore in Japan. So this is one uh, topic. But uh, the other one is uh, uh, Japan is uh, uh, owner of uh, the nuclear branch of General Electric. So this is um, uh, Hitachi and uh, uh, General Electric and uh, Toshiba and Westinghouse. Uh, so there is pressure, it is said, uh, from a certain area uh, uh, east of Japan that uh, needs still nuclear technology. And this is why they have to continue in this country with nuclear energy at any cost. And thirdly, uh, I would like to promote your excellent uh, film uh, in my home country, that is Germany. And uh, so is it available for me to uh, show it or to have at least uh, some excerpts out of it to make it uh, more uh, dispersed and uh, to give it promotion? Thank you. Okay, um, the last question we can discuss in private, uh, but we have a distributor in Germany, so it is already in his hands as far as uh, public uh, performance and so on. But we are, of course, open to private uh, scre screenings and association and cultural events. I mean, basically our policy is that we give it for free if it is a cultural or, uh, or social event, and we decide how much uh, is the cost uh, according with the ticket, uh, you know, this is not my, actually I'm not the one who should uh, talk about this. I know that my producer wants me to say that. Okay. Uh, as far as can, well, yes, I know Mr. Khan since about 30 years, since uh, I attended his uh, press conference when he was uh, Minister of Health in this country, Kosei Daijin. Uh, and he disclosed in a very brave and uh, I would say un-Japanese way the fact that some bureaucrats of his minister were responsible for the sale, licensing of uh, contaminated blood. And since then I, you know, I started to, to get along with him, interviewed many times, and then for a period, uh, this is not a secret, everybody knows, I, I did some uh, personal advisor to him, I quit journalism for a couple couple of years, so I did some ghost writing for him and you know. So uh, uh, I think really that he's a very honest person and uh, I, I am very uh, uh, proud of people, I'm very happy if people change their mind. I don't like people changing from, uh, you know, from far left to far right, but people that develop, that evolute, ev evolute it's a uh, proof and evidence of being uh, rational people. You can't stick to your idea for forever, otherwise you're not, you know, you're not reasoning. People should move if they realize that they were wrong. And this in politics takes a lot of guts. And he had the guts, unfortunately his party didn't, and it happened to him what happens in many other countries, it happens in Germany with uh, Schroeder, it happens in Italy with Prodi, that his own party destroyed him. He wasn't kicked out by the people. He was kicked out by his own party because of conflict of interest inside the party and because of the media, a total cowardness and, uh, and uh, incapability of uh, telling the truth, the right and the wrong. They just went with the flow. You know, this country uh, treats politics like uh, piranha, you understand this metaphor? I mean, the, 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 the piranhas uh, never attack a fish, a big fish, when it's genki. But once a little bit of blood spills out, then in a matter of seconds they kill him. This is exactly what happened here. It happened with Tanaka, it happened with Takeshita, it happened with Nakazone, it happened with Khan. And contrary to those people that I mentioned, Khan never was uh, responsible for any bribe. For you know, he lives in a very small house, totally unpolitician. If you go to Azo residence or Abe residence, you will understand the difference. 
I'm afraid that um, we are out of time. Um, typically for external speakers, uh, we provide them with uh, uh, an honorary membership of one year and we are honored uh, to have just a moment. And we are honored uh, to have several of those honorary members here today in attendance. Uh, since uh, Mr. D'Amelia is a member of our club, I am um, happy to offer you uh, a bottle of wine uh, wow. on behalf of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. So thank you, sir, for coming here thank and you for much. sharing your film. Uh, and thank you all for your attendance today. Well, thank you very much to everybody, and uh, I'll be around if somebody wants to talk uh, more. I'm available, so to say.